This is Johannes Gutenberg, who invented movable type 500 years ago and printed the first Bible. Recognized as the father of modern printing, Gutenberg stands on Park Row, the most famous newspaper street in the world, where giants of journalism mixed blood and ink to make history across the front page of America. Our story takes place in New York in the lusty days of the golden 80s, when Park Row was the birthplace and graveyard of great headlines. The street of America's first world-famous journalist, a printer's devil who helped draft the Declaration of Independence and was one of its signers, Benjamin Franklin, patron saint of Park Row. And it is the street of Phineas Mitchell. Why don't you go to work on the world? Pulitzer's introducing a lot of new things. Well, this is a fine newspaper, Mr. Hudson. But I'm not a journalist. I'm a machinist. I'm interested in the problems of setting type by hand. And how slow it is. Slow? Why, well, it's getting the straw out faster than any paper in the country. You gentlemen always manage to become involved in cats and jammer over journalism. I have learned there are four subjects one should never argue about. Anthropology, bird calls, romance, and of course, newspapers. You have become a wonderful legend, Mr. Davenport. It's tragic to remain a living legend, Mr. Merkenthaler. People only respect the dead. Often I feel guilty in taking such a long time to die. But I shall not die until I'm ready to forsake Park Row, which has already forsaken me. Mitch, how about being your pleasure? Jenny, a cake trainer. Stick a straight, screw in the chaser. Mitch, you got brains. Tell me, how can a character like me get to be a character enough to be written up in your paper? Rob a bank. Yeah, Harry Mendes has stolen a phonograph idea from you. Oh, no. Look, gentlemen, I'm serious. I, I can sing and dance. I got a wonderful personality. In fact, I got all the makings of a delightful character. Just because I'm not famous, people think I'm a bummer. Jump off the Brooklyn Bridge. You'll push Ireland's home rule right off the front. Well, you'd be the cock of the war. You'd be the talk of New York. <laughs> you know, that's a wonderful idea. The splash should be heard around the world. And I'd be happy that the fellow who jumped off Brooklyn Bridge marry my Jenny. And I'd be a widow before I got married. Don't listen to him, Steve. Mitch, he's taking you serious. Steve, you know, it's only 120 little feet from the bridge to the water. Now, that isn't much of a leap, but it's long enough to make you a celebrity. And when you open your own place, you can advertise the longest bar in the world. Steve Brody's 120-foot bar. Can you see it, Steve? Yeah, I can see it. Papa! Longest bar in the world. 
Why not have a couple of drinks and think it over? Certainly, my boy. Certainly, Jenny. A couple of anniversaries for Mr. Rose. Story really bothers you, doesn't it? Yeah. What are you gonna do about it? Try to hack it? No. Who's crying in your beer about Charlie Mock? He's dead. Uh, they hanged the wrong person. Could have broken Hackett's neck on the gallows. Where are you going? Potter's Fields. Gonna claim the body? Nope. Gonna lose my job. reported that an habitué of this concert hall had the gall to sneak into Potter's Field tonight and nail a plaque to the cross of one Charles Mott, executed by the state for murder. I had it removed. It would have been very simple to dispatch someone here, but I personally would like to confront the man responsible for this accusation against me and my newspaper. Every man's entitled to an epitaph. I nailed it to his cross. Ah, the ghoul himself. I'm a newspaper man. On what paper? Your paper. He works for the Star, Miss Hackett. What do you do, shuffle refuse behind the circulation rack? Editorial department. What's your name? Phineas Mitchell. Phineas Mitchell? There is no Phineas Mitchell on my paper. Firing me won't help the way you've prostituted journalism. I'm not running the gallows. I'm running a newspaper. He was tried by your paper. He was tried by jury. You sprung the trap. I simply broke the story. The story broke his neck. What was Charles Mott to you? Nothing. I just don't like trial by newspaper. I call it contempt by publication. I call it peddling papers. You'd use corpses to peddle papers till the readers found out what a frustrated journalistic fraud you are. It's publishers like you that give anarchists the ammunition to try and stifle a free press. Mr. Spiro. Yes, Miss Hackett? This, uh, the filer of graves, who employed him? I did. Why? He's a newspaper man. And the best. Oh, I have seen this global monument somewhere. He's Jeff Hudson, editorial. There's no Jeff Hudson on my paper. This? I don't know him. That? Thomas Guest, cartoonist, unemployed. Mr. Davenport, it displeases me to see you with this group. Charity, my dear, you've made of yourself a newspaper jackal feasting at the grave of a man you helped to execute. The Star reported facts, nothing else. The day the Star reports facts, Judas Iscariot will be sainted. Greeley turns over in his grave every time you go to press. Oh, another disciple of Horace Greeley. Mr. Spiro, escort this wench back to her slaughterhouse before I throw her out of here right on her front page. down like water and comes up like Nobel's dynamite. Mitch! Mitch, I done it! I done it, Mitch! I done it! Did you hear the splash? I done it! Done what? I jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge! Not a single bone broken. You're a liar. I done it and I got witnesses. You overstop slang, will you? I done it and I lived. And that's what makes you hotter than a, than a boiled sausage in a split oh. roll. Jenny, honey, I'll be a celebrity tomorrow when people read about me. And you'll be the proud bundle on my arm. Oh, you could have been killed. All right, Mitch, put it in the newspaper. Crazy. Put it in the newspaper. Steve Brody, party of the Bowery, aristocrat of the Fourth Ward. Jumps off the Brooklyn Bridge and lives to tell about it. You should have seen me. I was standing there looking down. Looking down at the bottom, 120 feet to death. That's the longest jump ever made by man. That's a long jump for nothing, Steve. I was fired from the star. You, you was fired? I couldn't get anything on that paper unless I died. All right, all right, Jeff, you put it in. Look, I'm standing there, see, I'm looking down. I was fired, too. Oh, well, come on. Well, hold your horses, hold your horses. Ain't there a working newspaper man in the Shandy Gap to cover the greatest feat in history? It's inside, I'm needing relief. And nothing has been watered. I don't keep no baptized bull Papa! Not a prop he puts a chip on the bar. You'll get sick and die. I'll stake him to a stone. Papa, you want me to tell him all you got that pretty figure because you wear a corset? Would you inform on your own father? I'll tell him how I lace up every morning. All right, all right, give him a drink. Yes, I've been studying you, Jenny. How'd you like me to draw your picture? Well, I was thinking of having our picture across the bar. Are you going to draw it on the wall? On a head of beer. Hey, I'll split your main brace if you give my bundle any of that cowboy talk. No offense, Steve, 
Remember the face on the barroom floor? I'm going to draw a face on a head of beer. Oh, bitch, you can't. Put the chip on the bar. There's the groom. Now let me see the bride. A large schooner, Jenny, with a big head. That's fine. Nothing to it when you know what you're doing. Perfectly easy, Jenny. You're pretty as a picture. See? The trick is, it's an indelible pencil. Take it, draw yourself a picture. If you're good at writing anything, if you haven't got a paper to put it in. You know what I'd do if I had a paper? Ah, here we go again. Daydreaming at night. And so, no, Mitch, what would you do? First thing I'd do is christen it. I'd call it the Globe. I'd make it the best newspaper on Park Row. That's what I'd do. I'd give away free ice and coal and summer excursions. Christmas dinners for the poor. That'd make them happy and make news. News makes readers. Readers make circulation, and circulation makes advertising. And advertising means I'd print my paper without the support of any political machine. That's what I'd do if I had a newspaper. Would you give me a job? What did Hackett pay you? 18 a week? I'd double it. You'd pay me $36 a week? Sure. If I had a newspaper. Why don't you dream up your own newspaper, Jeff, and give yourself $100 a week? Mr. Mitchell. Yeah? For three years, every night, I've been listening to what you'd do if you had a newspaper. Don't you like it, Mr. Leach? I like it very much. Yeah, that job printer got a shop in the Times, is that right? Tribune? Oh, yeah. I don't make up my mind quickly, Mr. Mitchell, but when I do, I act. Your dream kept me awake nights, and I made my decision. You sure O'Rourke's whiskey hasn't gone to your ceiling? Like you, I never touch anything stronger than beer. If I were interviewing you, I'd have nothing so far. What are you driving at? All my life, I've wanted to be what you are, a newspaper man. What you can do, I can't. What you need, I've got. What I dream about, you are. I've got a good steam press. I've got a little credit, the type foundry. Got a little newsprint, got a little cash. I want to go into partnership, Mr. Mitchell. You'll be editor and publisher of the newspaper. I'll be printer and handle the business end. You've got the heart. I've got the hand. You've got the head. I've got the press. What do you say? I mean a paper of my own. Yep. I'd be editor. Yep. And I'd do no man's bidding. You'd run the paper the way you want to run it, an answer to no one. Can I name it? Yes. You can name it, Mr. Mitchell. Is it a deal? Yep. You got yourself a newspaper. <laughs> Jeff, uh, you're on the staff, I promised. 36 a week. 30 what? 15 a week. What, 15? Well, you promised me 36 if you had a paper. No, it's a different paper. It was the Globe? It was a different issue. Oh, now, look. All right. 18 a week. Ever draw for a paper, Tom? No. You're on the Globe, 15 a week. Have I spent all your money yet, Mr. Leach? You're getting close. Mm. No, uh, what I need now is a good reporter like... Mr. Davenport. No, Mitch. You need young blood to bring life to a newspaper just for him. I can use some old blood, too. I'd like to have you on the globe. Steve, cheat at the cops! Out of the way. Anybody in here seen Steve Brody? He ain't here. He's down at Lizzie the Dove. What do you want of him, officer? He's broken the law. He just jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge. Any witness to seen jump? I saw him. Oh, we're wasting our time. Let's go down to Lizzie the Dove. Wait a minute, officer. Is this the man that jumped? Well, I don't know what his name is, but he's the fellow which jumped. Take him away. Mitch, you're a fake. You're a Judas. It's me, Brody, your bosom pal. Lock him in a tomb. Mitch, you're fake. You and your newspaper. You're a snake in the grass. All your reporters are snakes in the grass. Throw the keys away. Oh, Mitch, how could you have done it, Mitch? How could you have done it to my Steve, Mitch? This will be the Brody story on page one. 
from the bridge in safety. Steve Brody drops 120 feet to the water below, arrested and locked in the tombs. And I get the follow up. The globe frees Brody from the tomb. <laughs> the officer won't like this. The readers will. I'll make it six columns, six pages. You're shaving clothes? Four pages. All right, let's get them to the office. Look, Mr. Mitchell. I got printer's ink in me, too. See? You got a chore, boy? Nope, just Mr. Angelo and me. We take care of the shop. I run the press and he sets tight. Who's Mr. Angelo? This is Mr. Angelo. Well, Rusty, there's only one opening on the globe. You know the difference between a guideline, a key line, a point, a pull, a stick, a stone? Yes, sir. No, you don't. But you're going to learn. You're a printer's devil. From now on, Rusty, you're a newspaper man. Yes, sir. You got a key, Mr. Leach? Fine, we're putting the globe to bed tonight. I'll meet you all in the office in five minutes. Five minutes, Mr. Davenport. to work. Plenty of room for a hard-hitting, competent staff. Rusty, get all the papers. Don't get the star. And get rid of that shoe shine box. Yes, sir. Where do you hide it, Mr. Leach? Where's all your type? Looks like we'll have to set up all our stories in a couple of inches. Well, when that type's sorted out, we'll have enough to handle a paper. Most of our jobs have been handbills and cards. How much paper we got? Oh, a couple of half bundles in the back. I didn't figure you'd want to go to press so soon. Paper plants are all closed now. Volume one, number one, hits the street in the morning. Say, uh, what's a job printer like you doing with such a big press? I once tried to run a weekly. <laughs> I just didn't have what it takes to put out a paper. That press come between me and my wife many a time. Mm. <laughs> she finally got to grow fond of it, too. <laughs> Jeff? Yeah, what did it make? Your brother's a butcher over on William Street, isn't he? No, my brother-in-law, why? See how much butcher paper you can get from him. Butcher paper? Yeah, we're short of newsprint and borrow his wagon. Oh, he's a mercenary. Tell him the Globe will take care of the bill. <laughs> you don't know my brother-in-law. Well, here's all the cash I've got on me. <laughs> all right, everybody chip in. Come on. There you go. That's it. <laughs> Drive the wagon up in the alley. That'll be our circulation department. Give him a hand, Tom. All right, yeah. here we go. All right, let's all pile in and sort this type. Everybody grab a handful. Here's 
the papers, Mr. Mitchell. Where's my chain? Can, can I help? Yep, you might as well start learning how to sort pipe type now. Pipe? It means when your type is a mixed up mess. There'll be no time before you handle the hell box. What's that? This is the hell box. Everything is thrown in it. It'll be your job cleaning it up. And that's why you're called a printer's devil. Because you'll be living out of the hell box. Were you ever a printer's devil, Mr. Davenport? Yes, Rusty, I was an apprentice. Matter of fact, I was two years younger than when Horace Greeley started. He walked 11 miles to get that job. I walked 18. I was with him when he built this building. Right where you're standing, right where your shoes are, used to be the home of another great editor, Benjamin Franklin. That's why Ben's out there on Printing House Square, to see that nothing ever goes wrong on Park Row. Tom. Yes, sir. You know what that is? The stove. It's no stove, Tom. That's your office. Now, give me a drawing of Steve Brody jumping off the bridge, being arrested and dragged off to the tombs by the police. Take it over to Duffy's and Grady. Get a woodcut. Four columns. Wait for it, pay for it. I'll take care of you later. Right. Mr. Davenport, write me the Brody story. No name ranks higher than that of Steve Brody. Paint him a hero, bring tears because he was jailed. You shall have molasses in every paragraph. Mr. Mergenthaler. Yeah. About that machine, we'll pick it up in the morning. Have it ready, huh? Rusty, give Mr. Leach a hand. Jeff. Yeah? Jeff, steal everything you can, but make, make it, it fresh. fresh. Rusty! Hey, Rusty! Bring me that oil can! They got a new zinc process to publish black and white drawings. What's that? Not for us. Over at Life Humor magazine. Zinc, yeah? So that's how they get such nice lines with those Charles Dana Gibson illustrations. Gibson's getting as much as four and five dollars a drawing. You're getting a steady 15 a week, Tom. You're better off than Gibson. This editorial, Mr. Angelo. How's it sound? I don't know. I don't read. You what? I can't read. Mr. Leach! What do you want me to do? Say that I read when I don't read? Anybody can say that they read when they don't read, but I don't say that I read when I don't read. What did you find this, Mr. Angelo? He comes with the press. Oh, well, I have to set up the paper myself. He can't read. How can you have a compositor that can't read English? Now, don't get excited, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Angelo? Yes, Mr. Leach. Will you please follow copy, sir? Yes, Mr. Leach. Angelo can't read or write, but he's the fastest typesetter on Park Row. Mr. Angelo, don't ever change. The day you learn how to read, you're fired. I've seen a lot of volume ones, number ones. This is beautiful makeup, Mitch. Greeley started with $40 credit. Then it started in a cellar. You and 
good company, Mitch. How come you never got to be an editor? Edmund Burke, about 20 years before I was born, stood up in Parliament and said there were three estates of the realm. The peers, the bishops, the commons. Then he looked in the reporter's gallery and said, yonder there sits a fourth estate, more important far than they are. Somebody's got to go out and get the news, Mitch. People like me get it. People like you see that it gets to the readers. Some men are born editors. Some are born reporters. But a fighting editor is a voice this world needs. A man with ideals. And the joy of working for an ideal is the joy of living. Not bad, not bad. Oh, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Green. Mr. Raymond. Dana. Pulitzer. <laughs> what are Mr. Dana and Mr. Pulitzer doing on your walls? They're living. They're your rivals, your contemporaries. Dead or alive, they're still the best publishers on Park Row. One penny. Oh. I'm so sorry. number one. This is a stallion busting out of its stall, bristling with news. This is a newspaper man's newspaper. It'll die like all the rest of them. The others weren't printed on butcher paper. Yes? I apologize for disturbing you, Miss Hackett. Now, I'm not a journalist, but this is definitely an outrage to all newspapers. I can't understand why Mr. Spiro dislikes me. Oh, the entire editorial department dislikes you, Mr. Wiley. Because in you, they see the business executioner. But my first loyalty is to you. That's why they have contempt for you. Your first loyalty should be to the star. Is this a new kind of a printing press? No, I'm trying to compose type. Type? Type like this? Yeah. You mean you touch this machine and you make this? Mr. Angelo, today it is possible for a man to tap keys, write what he thinks, and it comes out on paper. You have heard of this machine, the typewriter? I don't know. 
I have watched you work. You are fine. The fastest compositor I have seen. But it takes such long time for a printer to put his thoughts into type. I think to help progress of printing, it is better if there is a machine that can do what you do, but very much faster, begging your pardon. If you can make this do what you say, you're smart like Mr. Guttenberg. Go make this. Yes, you've got over 400 years on him, Mr. Mergenthaler. That's quite an advantage. Through and Herr Guttenberg, many people have tried. You think he can make with that machine what he wants to make? Sure, he's a watchmaker. He has the golden touch with delicate machinery. Sometimes I don't know what he's saying the way he speaks. What do you mean? He's not clear. He speaks with a big accent. You know what I think? If he can make that machine work the way he says, you don't need me to set time. Oh, you'll learn how to operate it. You've got to know how to read to operate it? Look, you know as much about it as I do. Don't worry about it. You're not getting fired. How can I be fired? I don't got paid yet. You give me a job and right away I pay you money. I don't know if I like this work on a newspaper. The newsboys want to know when we're coming out again. What'd you tell them? I told them we're putting the globe to bed tonight and coming out the same time tomorrow morning. Fine. How's the bank account, Mr. Leach? Or do we come out with another porterhouse edition? We're lucky if we can get enough paper to come out with a rump roast edition. <laughs> <laughs> Better start breaking up the pages. Come along, Mr. Angelo. Yes, Mr. Leach. How's Brody? He's all right now. Jeff, yeah. go get the Barry boys, get them over to the tombs. Got you? Give my hand, Tom. Yep. Rusty, get the plug uglies over there. Yes, sir. I think I have a story. I made a few notes. I'll give it to you right off the cuff. Mm -hmm. Torch, arm, what is this? Part of that statue, a gift from France. Well, what about it? It's on display now in Madison Square. Yeah, well, we'll go over it later. Right now, I got a right to Brody follow-up. We better stir up the members of the Dead rabbits, too. Get them over there. Well, you have three rival gangs congregated in the tomb. Yeah. Brody belongs to all of them. What's the matter? Must we have a riot just to get a story? I didn't say I wanted a riot. Man jumps off a bridge and dies, there's nothing they can do about it. If he lives, they throw him in the clink. In this case, Brody's a hero. You can't deny that. There won't be any riot. Is this all you have? The Republican anti-saloon movement in New Jersey is spreading. Democratic majority in the House will reduce the number of employees. No, this is just a little party capital during fall elections. I want something controversial. There's a rumor that uh, the Globe's getting Brody out of the tombs tonight. Oh? Well, we're back to Mr. Mitchell again. You like him, don't you? I respect him. Brody broke the law. Take my word for it, the Globe isn't strong enough to free him. What does he want? All that I can tell you about him is every year it produces one great newspaper. Uh, 
Our stock isn't as good as your first issue. Wrapping paper. I made the rounds of the shoe shops. You know, it's very exciting, Mr. Mitchell. You came out with Brody's Jump this morning. Tonight, you have another issue of his release. Two issues in the same day. Remarkable. Only your page one has been changed, though. Once I get my hands on enough type, paper, and ink, I'll come out with two, three, maybe even four editions a day. Just change the front page. You know, Mr. Mitchell, I've been giving you a great deal of thought, and... Me, too. A lot of thought. Don't you like what you've been thinking about? Is that the only dress you've got? Oh, it's good makeup, Miss Hackett. Nice form, nice balance. Pretty as a perfect front page. Thank you. But you remind me of the obituary column. Ooh. You're always in black. Copies in. How come you're not in bed? I couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. I've been going over these notes you scrawled. How come you left your cuff here? Oh, I have extra cuffs. Yeah. Eiffel. Is that the same Eiffel that's building that tower in Paris? Yes. What did he have to do with the statue? He built the iron frame. Deliceps. Deliceps. Been eating at Denny's beef and bean again. Same Deliceps that built the Suez Canal? Yes, he had something to do with the story. What's this about a subscription? The Franco American Union raised one million francs for Bartholdi to build a monument. How much is that? $350,000. Why'd they build it? To cement the friendship of two great republics. France and the United States, a gift from a people to a people, not from a government to a government. So the people of France actually donated their own money to build the statue? That's right. What's this about a torch in Madison Square? Congress passed a resolution accepting the statue, but declined to grant a subsidy for the necessary base. Mm -hmm. Her head's at the battery, her body's on South Street, doesn't get a leg to stand on, has she? No, Mitch. She needs a pedestal. Oh. How much would that cost? A hundred thousand dollars. I am annoyed because you gentlemen seem to lack imagination and circulation ideas. Miss Mitchell has run the first front page editorial cartoon to appear in newspapers. Would you have run a cartoon on the front page, Miss Hackett? Splash the star with Penny Valentine? No, thank you. I'd rather see my paper in Hades than permit a frowsy woodcut to deface it. But at least the idea would have been born here. That's what I'm driving at. He came out with two editions yesterday. On butcher paper, wrapping paper used for shoes. Heaven knows what kind of paper he'll use tomorrow. Now he's offering to publish the name of every subscriber, no matter how small or large the amount. Pennies to dollars, rich people to poor people. Oh, Mr. Wiley, there's a German in this country experimenting with a machine to compose foundry type. Find him and get him. You mean Mergenthaler? Yes, that's his name. Do you know where he is? Oh, yes, he's working on his machine at the Globe. Akmar Mergenthaler? Mm -hmm. He's at the Globe? Yes. Good to 
Wie geht es? Herr Merkenthaler? Ja. Mein Name ist Fräulein Hackett. Ja. Von der Star. If you don't mind, I prefer to speak in. Of course. Mögenthaler. You know, I knew a Herr Mögenthaler in Württemberg. Oh, you have been to Württemberg. That is where I am from. In Germany, it's Mergenthaler. In America, Mergenthaler. It is easier to say. Oh, I like the people there, but I don't like Stuttgart. Oh, who likes Stuttgart? <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's been some talk on the street about the greatest invention in the history of printing since Gutenberg. If it works. Uh, if it works. The whole idea is to answer the dream of all printers. A machine that would end the hard and slow work of setting type by hand. It is now my dream, too. Well, I suppose you know that Mark Twain is also working on a typesetting machine, the page pattern. Yeah, I know. Uh, I've heard that Mark says it will be able to do everything but drink, smoke, and go on strike. <laughs> <laughs> Can you? Oh, it is so complicated, perhaps it will even talk. I shall try to follow the conversation. Why not? Perhaps you will have the answer I'm looking for. I call this a blower machine. I call it that because the mattresses up here are moved on to here. They are blown down by an air blast when I touch one of these keys. You mean you cast your own type when you touch those keys? Yeah. Then a bar of lead is melted so that the justifier forces hot lead against the mattress and it forms the type. See? The face of the type is in this mattress. How long would it take you to set up a column of type? Oh, as long as it takes 12, 15, maybe even 20 of your printers by hand. Then it'd be no problem at all to get out more than one issue a day. Oh, nothing. With 10, 20, maybe 40 of these machines, I could have a circulation of a million daily, maybe two million. Yeah, the big problem now is to separate the paper from the metal that sticks together and the type is not clear. Oh, we must solve that problem. I'm going to help you all I can, Mr. Mickenthaler. I have a great newspaper. And once we baptize this machine, we'll make newspaper history. I have a lot of room for you in composing. My men can move this machine over without turning a wheel. I'll give you all the support you need. Money, parts, assistance. What's the matter? Miss Hackett, I'm only interested in the progress of journalism. Of course. I would give you this machine for nothing if the star were a great newspaper. It is not great. It is not a newspaper. It is a cheap collection of words and garbage that you call journalism that will die. What are you, a parrot or an inventor? You have mechanical genius, use it. You're too brilliant a man to ape Mr. Mitchell and repeat his little paragraphs of envy. I like you, Mr. Mergenthaler. I respect you. And I want you. But understand that unless the star gets this machine, all your hard work will be buried on Park Row without a trial or a tombstone. Miss Hackett, if I need a tombstone, my friend Mitch will buy one for me, like he bought one for you. Oh, that's much better. Makes you look much younger, don't you think so, Mr. <laughs> Davenport? Yes. <laughs> Did he turn you down, Charity? Did who turn her down? It's obvious she didn't come over here to visit our steam press. She could have come over to visit me. No, Mitch, she's not that interested in the morals of an editor. I have a sneaking suspicion she just failed in an attempt to Shanghai Mr. Mergenthal away from the project. Yeah. Mr. Edison, here. I'm the editor. I want to give a penny for the Statue of Liberty. Well, thank you very much. What's your name? Martyr Dons. Papa said I was a good girl for giving my penny to the Globe. Rusty? Yes, sir? You give Miss Downs a Globe receipt for one penny for the Statue of Liberty Fund. Miss Hackett, would you care to uh, donate a substantial sum? I like the star, but at least there was some privacy for a man to think. Well, these separate little cells you've been working in are all wrong. We're going to have a real editorial department with everybody in one office. And I can see what's going on. Sit down, Jeff. Hmm? 
You got plenty of room? Yeah, plenty. At your copy desk. From now on, you're in the slot. When are you going to get a telegraph, Mitch? Yeah, it's a lot more important to hand down these walls. We need a wire service. I was over at Associated Press. You know what they want for their service for a week? Three hundred dollars. Well, the AP is worth it. Oh, sure, sure. I was just thinking, if I had three hundred dollars, you know what I'd do? I'd get myself a lot of good newsprint, the finest paper money could buy. And I'd come out with a real headline. Big, bold. 120 points. Where would you get such big type, Mitch? Oh, I'd make it. Cut it out of wood myself. That didn't have to be a big story. Mr. Davenport, when you write a story, why do you always put 30 at the bottom? 30 is a symbol to all printers. And it means it's the end of the story. There isn't any more. Is it hard to tell what's a story? Well, if you see a dog running down the street with a can tied to its tail, that's nothing. But if it stops, turns around, unties the can, and throws it away, that's a story. Gee, I'd like to have a dog like that. You want a pet? You've got a lot of them right here. Type lights. Type lights? Yeah. They are a little teeny weeny insects, and they live right inside here. And they get fed on the ink that sticks to the type. You never see them, Rusty? Ah, they have a lot of fun and play games. Can I look at them? I don't know. If Mr. Mitchell thinks you've got ink in your blood, he can look. Can I look at him, Mr. Mitchell? What do you think, Mr. Davenport? Rusty? Why do we put 30 at the end of copy? Because it's, it's the end of the story. There ain't no more. <laughs> All right, Mr. Angelo, let him look. Look down, Rusty. Way down. <laughs> <laughs> now you're a real printer's devil. <laughs> tie flies. There always will be tie flies, even if my machine will work. There always be tie flies. We've got to do something about increasing circulation. Well, a lot of people have tried to figure out new methods of selling fish. Now, well, I've been thinking about fish. Fish? Yeah. They got push carts out there, and they'd sell fish right on the streets. What's fish got to do with a newspaper? Oh, well, why not sell papers from push carts? Have a stand. Newsstand, the Globe Newsstand. I do not write words to be peddled from the street from a bush cart like fish. What do you think, Mr. Davenport? Well, I think there's sufficient wood in here for at least uh, three newsstands. You mind, Mr. Leach? Nope. Might be able to squeeze four out of it. We can use the room anyway. Hey, Mr. Mitchell, there is that Frenchman. He's going into the star. Yeah. Yeah, that's the Frenchman who's connected with the statue, all right. Well, maybe Hackett's going to give him a big check for the pedestal. Yeah, she'd just pull the curtains, we could see what was going on. Si les bonnes manières n'existaient pas, vous, vous les auriez inventées? Oh, mais mademoiselle, vous me convenez, enfin, je suis confus, je ne sais que dire. Mais il est très difficile de croire qu'un vrai gentilhomme pourrait aussi être un hypocrite. Ah, mais par, euh, pardon, je, je, je ne comprends pas du tout. Tout ceci, c'est du camouflage. Du, 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 du camouflage? Camouflage. Enfin, j'ai été pouvoir de monsieur. She's going to tell the whole world that my country gave America the statue just to buy a mouflage and loan. Mais enfin, qu'allons-nous faire, monsieur, avec le piédestal pour avoir de l'argent? No, just a minute, Mr. Dessard. Did she say when she was going to tell the world? Who? No, no, no. When? When is she going to tell the world? Now, you've got to be exact, Mr. Dessard. A newspaper has to be factual. Now, this is a very important story, but it's no good unless we get the facts. Écoutez, je dis qu'à mon la France, Demain, tomorrow. You're sure? Oui, 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 tomorrow. Tom. Yes, sir. Get a pen and paper. You're going to draw a picture of a beautiful woman. I want an extra 10,000 copies on the street this morning. Yeah, they're loading the wagons right now. We'll be the first paper out today. Oh, you look pleased with the editorial, Mr. Spiro. Change your mind about being factual? I'm looking at the globe. He's not only beat you at your own story, but he's been out on the street for 15 minutes. And there's something else new. Newsstands. And every one of them marked the globe. down a few highlights. The choice is yours. 
AF what? AFL. American Federation of Labor. It was organized tonight. The printers' unions joined it. The uh, other side of the cuff, match. That's an interesting item, too. ANPA. American Newspaper Publishers Association. It will officially be an organization at the end of this year, or the beginning of next. Got a list of the publishers? Mm, you should have been there. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to have met men like Pulitzer, Dana, Bennett, Reed, Jones of the Times. Was she alone? I didn't think that was important enough to notice. Just a question. I thought maybe she was with some out-of-town publisher. Well, she was alone, as usual. Does uh, that type of woman appeal to you? Look, Mr. Davenport, you're an old man, but you're not senile. That's why I hired you. You're very virile mentally. And a question like that isn't exactly proof of mental virility. What do you think of her? I don't. But as long as you're on the subject... There's very little I can add. I'm right back on the first paragraph again. All I can tell you is her name is Charity, of which she has none. If you had to write her obituary, what would you write? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. I could tell you. If I had to write a robot. Charity Hackett, publisher of the Star, is dead. She was ruthless and ambitious. And her beauty was like an almanac. It lasted into her death. Her face was better than all the letters of recommendation in the world. Poise, primitive nature. Her voice, a short-lived sonata. You're in love with a corpse, my boy. In. I was just going over the list of publishers. My story would be incomplete without a quote from you. Sometimes it takes more than a quote to complete a story, Mr. Mitchell. That's why I dropped in. All right. Complete the story. Well, I was in the midst of champagne, and I came to the decision it would be a very good idea if we got married. Oh, a merger. Your masthead and mine. We could elope with tomorrow's first issue. It'd be a wonderful honeymoon. Uh, not on a biological basis, but on mass circulation of the star globe. Mm hmm You know, I was just thinking. I could buy a ton and a half of newsprint with that coat. Oh, you could have a lot of things I have. A large staff. A circulation wagon, wide distribution, money, contact. You could be the most famous editor in New York. And by the way, this coat is worth five tons of newsprint.
There'll be only one baby in the family. And we'll christen it the globe. I'll complete the story for you, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Mitchell's sensational treatment of the news, coupled with a crusading spirit, can easily develop into grave competition. Oh, I agree, Miss Hackett. Then why haven't you done something about it? I have no jurisdiction over the editorial policy of this newspaper. Oh, there is no editorial policy that can beat him. Mr. Wiley. Yes? I want you to stop his source of supply. Paper, type, ink. The globe will be dead next week. Quit you breaking up our newsstands. Come on. What's the matter? What's it up my newsstands? This is going to stop me from selling papers. Busting up your what? I thought you were a newspaper man. Where's Leach? I didn't like it, Mitch. You wanted a different editorial department, so he turned your desk around. Now you can see everything that's going on. All right, all right. Where's Leach? He got a butter cake Dick's broody wagon. Went to South Street to the fish market to try and get some paper. Well, he better come back loaded with paper. I'll give you some copy in a minute, Mr. Angelo. Jeff, we're going to tell this town all about Hackett's circulation package right now. I want you to get this in the lead. The Globe fights with news, not knuckles. We use words, not fists. What happened to you? We killed the horses. Burned the wagon. Dumped our paper in the Where's Rusty? They ran over him, both legs. Will he live? I don't know. Will he walk? They don't know. He's at the hospital. Who ran over? Monk Rogers. I know him. Get him. wagons and dumping newsprint and the jerk isn't gonna stop me from coming out every day. You started a war, Hackett! A circulation war! And I'll finish it! Mr. Spiro, go back to your desk. Please. Mr. Wally. I don't want an explanation. I just want to tell you one thing. I do not have to resort to physical violence to compete with the Globe or any other newspaper. What you have done is an affront to me and an insult to the star. What do you want? Look, you're certain that I'm responsible for the circulation war. Well, that's not important. 
it's important that you and I have a truce. It's a little late for waving a white flag. We've already suffered a casualty. There'll be more casualties if we don't stop the violence. Heard you went up to the hospital to find out about Rusty. Just running down a git kind of got your conscience, huh? Look, I fired Mr. Wiley. Someone had to give the order to kill the globe. Did they tell you Rusty might lose both his legs? Big iron wheels ran over him. That wide. The star's got the only wagons in town with wheels that wide. Why don't you run over old Mr. Davenport? He's a nice old man, about ready to die. Make a great story if he died for a paper, wouldn't it? Or maybe little Mr. Angelo. You'd only need a little wagon to crush this little body. I want to see the editor. You're talking to him. I thought you'd print the name of every contributor to that uh, Liberty Fund. We do. Well, I've gave five dollars last week and I've never seen my name in the paper yet. What's your name? Taylor. George Taylor. Taylor, huh? Mm-hmm. T. Taylor. Taylor, 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 Taylor. No George Taylor in here. Well, here's my receipt. Where'd you get this? What do you mean, where'd I get it? Who gave you this receipt? I don't know his name. Look, mister, I run a little smoke shop down the Bowery. I've been there for 20 years and I got a good name. I don't like your tone. I gave $5 in good faith. Now, you put my name in the paper or give me my $5 back. I can't put your name in the paper, Mr. Taylor, and I can't give you back your $5 because we never received it. This is a forged receipt. It's not ours. I'm sorry. Where is this Mr. Mitchell? I'm Mr. Mitchell. I gave $25 for the pedestal, not a single mention of my name in the Globe. And my husband gave $50, Mr. Mitchell. $50. You get your money back, George? No, I didn't. Mitchell, I've been around this street a long time. And I hate seeing a paper using its pages to cheat the public. Now, I gave $7 to the Liberty Fund, and I haven't seen my name in the Globe. And a lot of my friends are holding receipts. We're beginning to think that you're using this patriotic gesture to pocket the money. Now, if we don't get our money back, I'm going to see that Washington hears about it. It's only to prevent a tragedy that I've come here to see you. Someone is passing forged receipts for the pedestal fund. The Attorney General of the United States ordered Mitch to return all monies to subscribers. Why don't you like me? I don't dislike you, Charity. I simply am not fond of you. If you were fighting the Tribune, the World, the Herald, the Sun, that would be a real fight. But you're fighting the globe because Mitch excites you antagonizes you and outwits you. You're jealous of him. And you've made it a personal newspaper war. I can understand if you love him. You and I both know you'll never get him. You come from a great line of newspaper people. But you, you're not of our profession. Only on the surface. I'm glad you're a woman. For when you die, the name of Hackett shall die with you. Hey, barmaid. Huh? Cute, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. patriotic? You want to give some boodle for the Liberty Statue? Yeah. Just give me what you can, I'll call you patriotic. Uh, sure, I'm patriotic. Uh, here's a dollar, mister. And here's your receipt. Well, watch the globe paper for your name. Come on, Ray. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, don't you want to see the first barmaid in America make you a special drink? No, no, we gotta go. Well, I'll make your blue blazer on the house. Can you make a blue blazer? Well, can I make a blue blazer? I can make the best blue blazer you ever had. Oh, oh, for that. Like we say, right? Well, 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 anybody that's given money for that pedestal, they deserve more than a blue blazer. That's right. Like well, you know what? I got lots of patriotic customers here. Yeah. I'll bet you I can get you twenty dollars for that pedestal. Twenty dollars? Got any more of them receipts? Oh, we can. Hey, awesome. right. Well, I, 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 my father gave ten dollars for the statue. I heard today that Ed Shaughnessy, the music impresario from Delmonico's, gave one hundred dollars for the Statue of Liberty. And my father's brother gave twenty dollars for the statue. Wow. And his brother-in-law gave thirty dollars for the statue. Hey, yeah, if you give me some of them receipts, I'll get some for you. I'll make you Jenny's special brandy match. Sure, I'll just say All right, gentlemen, now wasn't that worth waiting for? That's what I call a blue blazer with a shot of alabazam and a shot of Santa Clarita. As a matter of fact, I even put a little print of thing sheep dip in this one because you're so patriotic. Now, that's what you call a blue blazer. Wasn't that worth waiting for? Yeah. That's a blue blazer mixed with a shot of alakazam and a shot of Santa Gary. You sure they're on the house? Sure they're on the house for anybody that's patriotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. for that. Sure. Steve, that's the guy that's been passing that forged receipt. <laughs> You know, 
I did to the man that ran over the kid's legs, and I'll crush your head in with this unless you tell me who's paying you to pass those liberty receipts. You can't scare me. Wiley of the stars behind me. I ain't afraid of you or your paper. That's the story I want. Turn him over to the federal authorities, and we'll pick up the newsprint. Mr. Davenport, I want you to write the story exposing Hackett. You can tell the readers that there'll be a Statue of Liberty on Bedloe's Island in less than 60 days. I guess that's the big story for your 120-point headline. Don't tell me about it, Mr. Davenport. Write it. Are you all right? Hey, Jeff, give me that bale of beer. Mr. Mergenthaler, yeah. are you all right? Yeah. What about Mr. Davenport? He was gone before it happened. Gone where? <sighs> Wrote the story, he said good night, and he went home. All right, give me a hand. Let's get him in the other room. Easy, Easy now. <laughs> Easy. Careful. Are you all right, Mr. Mercantoller? Yeah, yeah. Did you get a good look at any of them? No, they were too fast. They had it all figured out like clockwork. Each man knew where to hurt us most. Yes. Well, it'll just mean we come out a little later, that's all. Jeff, yeah? find that story Mr. Davenport wrote. Mr. Angelo, let's sort out this pipe type. He takes us a month to separate this type. Look, they threw mailing glue all over it may take more than a month. Well, we got a lot of paper out there. We can't let it go to waste. We can't afford to miss a single edition. Mr. Davenport's story isn't here. What do you mean it isn't there? It's got to be there someplace. Look around over there. I'll look on the desk. It, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Davenport's obituary. Who wrote it, Mr. Mitchell? Mr. Davenport. Read it, Mr. Mitchell. Josiah Davenport, 75, journalist, died today at peace with Park Row. His search for a man to carry on the fight of Horace Greeley was successful. His last words were written to this man. Quote, Phineas Mitchell, the Globe. In most countries, there is no freedom of the press. In the United States, there is. This freedom was born in 1734 in the libel trial of John Peter Zanger, printer and publisher of the New York Weekly Journal. He was acquitted by jury. When anyone threatens your freedom to print the truth, think of Zenger, Franklin, Bennett, and Greeley. Think of them. Fight for what they fought for and died for. Don't let anyone ever tell you what to print. Don't take advantage of your free press. Use it judiciously for your profession and your country. The press is good or evil, according to the character those who direct it. And the Globe is a good newspaper. I have put off dying, waiting for a new voice that needs to be heard. You are that new voice, Mr. Mitchell. And now that I have found a man worthy enough to die for, I am ready to die. The old press is silent. And if there's a place where newspaper men go, when the last edition is put to bed, I want to be there to hear the roar of the globe and the thunder of her type. I want to be there still covering a story on the cuff of the last of the survivors who saw American journalism born on Park Row. Thirty.
you make a sound? Yeah. Go ahead. Call us, Mr. Mercantola. Line of fight. Good. Mr. Leach, get that press fitting. Mr. Angelo, railroad those forms. Steve, get that butcher paper in there. Just get started on the copy. We'll put Mr. Davenport's obituary right on page one and we'll box it. I'll write the Hackett expose. Mr. Mercantola, if I give you my story right here, can you get the words out of your line of type as I talk? Yeah. Line of type. That is a good name for my machine. There's your lead. The press is good or evil according to the character of those who direct it. And now that the story is revealed, the Globe will continue its subscription drive for the lady in New York Bay. She live? She's in bad shape. There'll be no glove out tomorrow, Mr. Mitchell. Start looking for new jobs.
sure is a wake for the dead. things I wanted to print, fight, expose. Made history together. We just started something new, newspaper business. Had it all figured out. at you, Mr. Mitchell. You had a paper to put out. And what you do, you go to a saloon. How did you do it? My machine. We had the copy. While you were filling your belly with schnapps, I was on the linotype. The explosion hurt it a little, but I fixed it quickly. Where'd you get the press? Right across the street. I came in here after the explosion. I read your page one story. I didn't order the violence. Mr. Wiley did. He blew up your press room. I am responsible because I gave him the order to kill the globe. In doing that, I violated the publisher's code. That's why I borrowed your staff for the paper makeup, and I printed the globe. Good ink. The best. Eight pages. Real newsprint. Your headline deserved it. How many on the street? 12,000. We're doing what you always wanted to do. By noon, there'll be four different editions of the Globe on the street. And, uh, to complete the story, Mr. Mitchell, I didn't commit newspaper suicide because I love you. Oh, no. I killed my newspaper so yours could be born. Because I read Mr. Davenport's obituary. For the first time, I really see what you're fighting for. That's why I'm giving you to Park Row.
when you see this monument on Bedloe's Island, this memorable day of October 28, 1886, I want the whole world to know that we have a Statue of Liberty because of a newspaper.